So this is how I view pharmacogenetics. It's the, the use of genetic information to determine who will respond favorably or unfavorably. And I think actually unfavorably may be a better phenotype to a given type of treatment. And the reason I say that is that in especially the condition that I study, asthma, there are a lot of folks that have a uh, placebo effect from treatment. And so if I'm studying a drug and I give everybody placebo, you know, that's my trial, I compare placebo A to the pink placebo to the yellow placebo, uh, and I know this is just a sugar pill and shouldn't have any biological impact on asthma, but I know that 25% 20 of people are going to get better from this. Um, and if I'm stratifying my outcome by genotypes, you'll see that I could be misled. I'm, but if I'm looking for a, a phenotype which is less likely to be contaminated by a placebo effect, uh, for example, uh, people who get worse with treatment, uh, then you're, I'm looking at the natural history of the disease and I'm less likely to be uh, confounded by that. Now, if you're studying something like cancer or heart disease with a hard endpoint, which is death, you know, heart disease with a soft endpoint, which is chest pain, it's hard to know. But heart disease with a hard endpoint, something that's easy to define, you don't have this big a problem. And you can begin to use favorable and unfavorable responses. So I think it's a little more robust phenotype. What it means is that whenever I do a study, I have to think about the contaminating effect of this. Looking at my data, I know that some of the people whom I think are better because of treatment, or in this case because of a treatment by genotype interaction, are just better by chance, and that there are more likely to be people better by chance in the placebo group than there would be if there was a no treatment group, just because of the nature of that effect. So it's a little bit of a contamination, but not a big problem. So the idea of pharmacogenetics is that there's variability in treatment response. So if I treat a bunch of people, uh, that some people are going to get better, some people are going to stay the same, some people are going to get a little worse. Since we don't think the medicine makes them worse, usually we think that it's the disease getting worse because the medicine's ineffective. So uh, the first thing that you want to do if you want to study the pharmacogenetics of anything, you want to look to see how variable the treatment response is among members of a population. Uh, and there needs to be substantial variance in treatment response among members of a population. So I'm going to give you an example now from the asthma world of a study in which uh, there was variation in the treatment response among members of a population. So uh, this is a clinical trial. It's easy to understand. Uh, here are patients that are enrolled with uh, mild to moderate asthma. And this is asthma, which is more of a nuisance than a real medical problem. So if patients are not treated, it doesn't represent an ethical issue. So that's how we can get away with a two-week placebo run-in period because it's okay not to treat people. And they're then randomized to receive beclomethazone, which is an inhaled steroid and is one of the standard asthma treatments, compared to Montelukast, which is an antagonist of the action of the uh, cysteineolucotrienes at the cis-LT1 receptor. Now the primary outcome in this and a lot of the data I'm going to show you is the forced expiratory volume in one second at 12 weeks. So as an aside by way of pulmonary physiology, I don't think we recognize any of you from my um, HST pulmonary class. Right? None of you have taken that. Uh, if you breathe in all the way to the top and then breathe out as hard and fast as you possibly can, something like you might do on your birthday if you have a lot of candles to blow out, uh, how fast you can breathe out beyond a certain level of effort is an intrinsic property of your lungs and airways and not of how hard you're trying. If you don't, it, you, so you have to try hard enough to reach that plateau and that is not a superhuman effort. Almost everybody with a little bit of effort can reach that level where how fast they can breathe out is not related to how hard they're trying to breathe. So that if we measure the amount of air that comes out at one second, we're measuring an intrinsic property of the lungs and not the motivation of the subject. And it's beyond a certain level of effort. And the way you determine whether your subjects are motivated is usually do two or three maneuvers. Uh, you have somebody coaching them through it. They're now blasted out so you get to see whether they're actually trying. 
in that if this test is done correctly, the variability among tests done in a row is 3 or 4 percent. Even among you all, I've never probably done this test before. Maybe one of you have has asthma. The statistics would be that one or two of you would have asthma. Have done tests like this without any coaching or with m minimal coaching can get tests that are reproducible within 3 or 4 percent off the street. So it's a very useful test because it's easy to do. Uh, and we use it as an outcome indicator in a lot of breathing trials. And just to help get you straight, a bigger FEV1, the more air you can get out in one second, the better off you are. So that's kind of the, this outcome indicator. So here are the data. Uh, and this is the trial outcome. This is what was published in uh, this journal. Uh, and you can see that the patients assigned to the beclomethazone arm improved their FEV1 about uh, 11 to 13 percent uh, on average, while the people in the Monte Lucas group improve it uh, 7 to 9 percent. Now, we know from studies done in patients with asthma that if you improve your FEV1 about 10 percent, that you can perceive it. You know, it's something that you say, hey, this is, I'm better than whatever you just did. Uh, that below that, it's hard to distinguish. That above that, if you improve it twice as much, you really don't distinguish it that much unless you happen to be engaging in really heavy exercise. So it's almost a dichotomous kind of variable. People who got better, people who didn't get better. But you look at these data and you'd say, gee, it looks like beclomethazone is almost twice as good as monte -Lucast. So here are the data uh, now shown as a, in histogram format where on the vertical axis we have the percentage of patients and on the horizontal axis we have changes in FEV1. So the patients that will be over on this end had a big response. Patients over here actually got worse with treatment and the null is sort of right in the middle and this uh, 10 to 20 percent bar, anything over this direction uh, is an improvement. I don't know how to get that uh, to go away. Uh, I'm, Usually these little boxes go away if you leave them alone long enough. Uh, so uh, here, let's see if I do it again. Nope. Cancel. Uh, so here we are with Monty Lucas, and you see that there were about altogether 5% of the population that really did great. There were about 7% of the population that, that actually got a lot worse. Um, and that it turns out that it's about 42% of the population that improved a significant amount. Now, compare this to beclomethazone, which, remember, on average, did twice as well. Well, here's the difference. There were twice as many people that did spectacularly well, but on the average, not a lot. It works out to be 10% versus 5% in some. And rather than having 7% of people who did poorly, it was just 4%. So it turns out that if you trim these by getting, you know, like they do sometimes in the Olympics, you know, they get rid of your best and your worst scores. Uh, if you trim this end and that end, the, the groups are almost identical. And so that the difference in the means reflects uh, poorly on actually what the difference would be in the population. Because if you're a patient sitting in my waiting room and your FEV1 is improved by 60% and you're sitting next to somebody's FEV1 is improved 0%, the average improvement between you was 30%, but both of you didn't get better, even though the inference would be that you all that you got better. So here we see a big population variability in response to Monte Lucast, an inhibitor of the actions of leukotrienes, leukotriene receptor, and beclomethazone. So I'm going to explore the, the basis of these two, and depending on time, one more treatment in asthma. Uh, there's big population variability. Now, the second thing that you need to know before I get to this is that, in, which I didn't bring you the data to show, is that if you're, if I study you once and you're over here, and I'm looking at a genetic event that is something that you inherited that whenever I study you, you ought to get it better in, with this medicine. Because if it's a genetic event, it ought to be something that is imprinted on you and stay that way. While if it's variable from time to time, then it's not going to be useful. So you need to know how repeatable the treatment response is. Because if, the if the basis of the variance is genetic, it ought to be highly repeatable. While if it's due to random noise, like uh, the reason you improve so much here 
was that during the two-week run-in period, you'd spent time with your mother-in-law who has six cats, and you're allergic to cats. So your lung function was low before you started. You then got better during the treatment period because you got away from the cats. If I then restudied you, you wouldn't get this kind of response. So, well, all right, so I, I, I said, I, I actually, I can, I can show you those data depending on how much time we have. Well, I'll show it to you right now. Just it's out of the context of this talk. It's, uh, pardon me one second. I'll see if I can find. I have these data actually uh, in another talk. Um, no, no, it won't take too long. Hopefully it won't take too long to find it. I could, let's see. Um, it's, whether it's, nope, that's not that one. Uh, I'll give it one more try here. I just have to look in a different place. It's here. Uh, nope. One more try. I thought it was there. Um, <coughs> it's a nice thing about having a big hard drive. You can carry all sorts of stuff around. See if it's in this one. Yeah, here they are. Okay, so here are here are data from from trial. And I was lucky because in, this is a different drug, but this acts at the five lipoxygenase pathway. Um, and I worked the, the drug company that I work with gave me the data. You know, they sent it to me on a CD. And a lot of drug companies won't do that because they're afraid that you're going to do something that will hurt them with respect to their market position. They tend to be really paranoid. So to get on this graph, you had to improve your FEV1 by 12%. Uh, the, the consensus definition about what you can perceive varies between 10 and 12%. So when I did this graph, it was four or five years ago, I drew the 12% line. There were 240 people in the trial, 97 of which improved with FEV1 by 12% on the eighth day of therapy. They were then um, studied on day 36, 64, and 92. In this graph, when I graphed the data on my computer, I had all these lines lying on top of each other, and they didn't get any thicker. So I constrained the data through this point here. So this isn't a data point, but this is simply to allow you to see how many people are in this group that are in that group. It's a graphical presentation thing. I mean, if I had clinical data that looked like that, I, um, I wouldn't believe it. So anyhow, what you can see is that uh, of this group of people who improved, some actually got worse and stayed worse. A lot of them got better and stayed better, and there were some that kind of moved around. If you follow the dots carefully, you'll find that three quarters of the people are above this 12% line on two of the three subsequent occasions. So that's active treatment with Zilutin, which is the active drug. Here are the same entry criteria, same trial treated with placebo. Uh, and you can see that, as I told you, there are placebo responders, right? These people got better and stayed better. Uh, in this trial, however, of the people who were above on day eight, only about 40% are persistently above the line. In fact, you can see there are a bunch of people here who flunked out, and then they kind of went up and down. So there's not a uh, percent effect. Now, if you look at the people who don't get better, these are non-responders to treatment which I defined as 5% or less, so I left myself a zone of kind of middle response. See, there are a bunch of people who don't get better, and in general, if you don't get better, you stay not better, although there were a few people who were kind of late bloomers. It's a relatively small proportion, and when you look at placebo, it looks about the same. So you can see why the, uh, the non-response phenotype's a little better than the response phenotype in terms of the noise. Because you, uh, the people who don't get better and the placebo people who don't get better look pretty much alike. While the active treatment guys are 
um, contaminated by these people who you would say were better when in fact they weren't. So there you, there you go. That should answer the question there. So I can close this one and get back to uh, I guess I closed the one I was we were working on. Uh, here we are. And uh, so we're talking about repeatability and the response in, in Sewell Wright. Have you heard about Sewell Wright? You know who he is? Population geneticist. He practiced, well, he did most of his work at the University of Chicago. He died about 15, 20 years ago. He wrote a four volume series on, the, on human population genetics before we had any markers or anything. And he kind of forecast and did a lot of the, the primary mathematics, which are the uh, basis of pop population epidemiology. And uh, he actually set up a, uh, derived an equation for what he calls repeatability. Now, what I would really like to know is the heritability of the asthma treatment response. But to do that, I'd have to study multi-generation families. And there are three problems with that. One is that asthma treatment is changing. Uh, second is that we know that an asthmatic at age 10, at age 25, and at age 55 responds differently to treatment that their disease tends to get uh, ingrained and unresponsive to treatment. And so you'd have to be able to study, let's say, all the asthmatics within a family at age 20, but the asthma treatment that you gave the patient's uh, father is no longer available. There's something better, and so you aren't going to be able to get that treatment. And of course, if the patient's father's now 50, and you can't treat him because uh, the uh, asthma treatment response varies. So it's going to be almost impossible, I think, to, to get the data you need to determine the heritability of asthma treatment. So we look at the repeatability, and the calculated repeatability for beclomethazone and Montelukast from clinical trials that we've done is on the order of 80%, which is good but not awesome. Um, but in, uh, repeatable enough that you think that there's a pharmacogenetic signal. Yeah. Well, all right, so asthmat, so now we're not talking about the heritability of the asthmatic treatment response. We're talking about the heritability of asthma. Yeah, right, and the, and the asthmatic phenotype has got about, in, in twin studies, varies, but it's on the order of 65% or so, comparing monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Is there any reason to connect those two in terms of the disease itself and the treatment? Or um, well, you see, one of the real problems with asthma is it, it's difficult uh, it's, it's, it's like an uh, impressionistic picture. If I'm looking at it from 30 feet, it's easy to see what it's about. As I get really close up, I lose the picture. And it's uh, very di been difficult to define because there's no biochemical test I can use. Quite often people look at the inheritance of, uh, of serum immunoglobulin E levels because it's related to allergy but not asthma. But it's a very quantitative phenotype. Um, and so the, the, the definition of asthma is airway obstruction which varies spontaneously as a result of treatment. The problem is you take two people that have the same uh, genetic background, but one of them is exposed to a lot more allergen than another. Even if you have uh, monozygotic twins and one of them plays basketball and you know changes his clothes and wears gym clothes that have been sitting around in a ratty locker and gets that exposure every day, while the other one's a swimmer, and doesn't have the same kind of exposure. Uh, one of them will develop asthma, one may not, and so you'll say it's, it's not inheritable, when in fact it requires both a genetic background and an environmental exposure to manifest the phenotype. The classic examples are there are a lot of people from uh, Hong Kong who have latent ragweed allergy, and they're okay in Hong Kong, and they move to the States, there's no ragweed, or very little in Hong Kong, move to the states where there's a lot of ragweed and they get really asthmatic in the fall. And they didn't have a problem back home because there wasn't the allergen. You come, come here and they have allergen and they get exposed. So it's a combination of environment and genetics that appears to, to bring the disease on. So with all that, I'm gonna, the research I'm going to tell you about represents the work of a whole pile of people. Uh, this is most of the pile shown here. Um, there are people at the Channing Lab, which is, uh, I'm sure, you've, have you heard from uh, any of these folks at the Channing? I don't know. Uh, Zach works with some of them. 
the Pharmacogenetics Research Network, uh, the Asthma Clinical Research Network, these are both uh, NIH-sponsored uh, consortia uh, that I've been part of. And the Whitehead Institute, I'm sure you've all heard of those folks over at MIT. So I'm going to talk about these three asthma treatments. These are the, uh, three of the major asthma treatments and what we know about their pharmacogenetics. Uh, and we'll see how things go. Uh, so this first one we used a candidate gene strategy. You're familiar with candidate gene strategies? So uh, this is work I started about a decade ago. Um, I had a, a, a postdoc from uh, Canada who was interested in the problem. And I said, what we want to do is to look at um, the 5 lipoxygenase pathway. That's the leukotriene pathway. Because uh, we knew the biochemistry of drugs. And I showed you the data. The red and green lines are from this drug Xylutin that inhibits the action of the enzyme 5 lipoxygenase. In fact, I've been involved in the development of these four drugs worldwide. And so we knew the structure of this enzyme. We knew its uh, genomic sequence. And our question was, so when you have patients with asthma who show up in your office, they all have phenotypically similar asthma. But we think that some of them may have asthma because they have an excess of 5-lipoxygenase products in stimulation at this receptor. But a clinically indistinguishable phenotype can be someone that has asthma due to an excess of substance P, a neuropeptide having nothing to do with this. Or you could have somebody that has an excess of histamine or someone that has an excess of neurokinin A or endothelin. So there are probably a half a dozen endogenous bronchoconstrictors which have totally different biochemical pathways that could lead to the same clinical phenotype. And so you recognize that as asthma, and they probably represent people that have a different genetically programmed mast cells and neural responses. So our argument went that uh, if you uh, could look at the variability of the treatment response here related to the enzymes in this pathway, you'd be able to begin to pick out people whose asthma was associated with leukotrienes and specifically whether there would be variability here. So what we started with is we had the human 5-lipoxygenase gene. Uh, we knew it's the intron and exonic structure. You know, when I started the work, this was kind of like hot new information. Uh, and uh, this guy from Canada worked on the problem for a month and quit. He said it was too hard, and I was really blessed. I had a, a, a postdoctoral fellow from Korea, actually he was a visiting scientist, and he was probably the most patient person in the entire world, I think. Uh, and he plowed his way through uh, this gene exon by exon, doing old-fashioned uh, sequencing, SSCP, um, where and this took him almost three years. Now, this kind of work now takes three weeks or maybe three days, depending on what kind of genotyping outfit you have. Um, and what he found, which was quite discouraging, was that there were no common, that is, alleles greater than a frequency of 0.15, DNA sequence variants leading to a modified protein sequence in the entire 5 lipoxygenase gene. You had a question, or were you just stretching? No, just All right, good. We want you to have a, we want you to have a pulmonary embolus over there. So, uh, there were, however, uh, variations in the transcription factor binding region, which is uh, just upstream. It's the 5-LO gene promoter. Now, what was known about the gene promoter at that time, which is actually hung in there to be true, is that just ahead of the translation start site, uh, there are a series of SP1 and EGR1 uh, binding motifs. In fact, uh, there are five of them in tandem. And if you search the GenBank, this is the only gene where that occurs. Uh, so this sequence GGG, CGG is repeated over and over and over again. Uh, and that's just, uh, it's right in the core promoter. Uh, and that's where the sequence variants were found. In fact, uh, the sequence in the gen bank has five of these in a row. Um, and we've identified individuals with three, four, and six. Uh, and seven, uh, less commonly, we've in fact can identify people with two. And so this is a variable nucleotide tandem repeat. People could use it for genotyping, but we showed that it, uh, it bred true. So it's not one that it tends to expand. It's not like it is in, in Huntington's disease. Uh, if your mother and father have different alleles that you're going to have uh, and are homozygous for them, you're going to be a heterozygous. So we did enough family studies to, to know that this was a, a stable VNTR. 
And then what we did was we uh, took uh, human uh, cells, these are HeLa cells, and transfected them with the wild type promoter and promoters with uh, which has five repeats and with uh, three, four, and six repeats. And studied them in a CAT assay. This is a chloramphenicolesterol transferase assay. So the higher the bar, the greater the promoter activity. And you can see that all the mutants are less effective at driving uh, gene transcription than the wild type. Now this is sort of one of these moments that you never forget in clinical investigation. I was going over with these data with uh, Tucker Collins, who's a professor of pathology at the Brigham now. And he looked at these data and says, you know, Drazen, you're absolutely right, but you've got to find something else to do uh, because these variations are too small. Uh, no one wants to study a 35 or 40 percent decrease in cat transferase activity. It's too small. But what I knew from clinical trials was that if I inhibited 5 lipoxygenase 35 or 40 percent, that I got a very substantial clinical benefit. So the argument that we had in our head was that uh, if patients with variations in the 5 lipoxygenase, the ALOX5 promoter, had downregulated ALOX5 production, that they wouldn't respond to anti-leukotriene treatment. The idea is that patients with the, this sort of funny form of the core promoter would have uh, some other cause for their asthma. Their asthma may be due to antihistamines or to uh, substance P or to some other variant, but so, some other mediator, but that leukotrienes wouldn't be important because these are all down-regulatory mutations. So I was lucky at the time because uh, Abbott Pharmaceuticals had developed the 5-lipoxygenase inhibitor Zilutin, and it had two big problems they were trying to overcome. One is that it, it has to be uh, given to patients uh, four times a day. And, you know, that's a pain. Uh, you can, if you give patients the pill to take once a day, they'll do it. Twice a day is harder. Three times a day requires a saint, and four times a day requires God. It's almost impossible to do. Um, now, I did actually have patients that had pretty bad asthma that took it four times a day. So Abbott developed the compound you could take twice a day. The second problem for them was that uh, about 3% of people that took this drug developed abnormalities of liver function tests. And although nobody had a liver that checked out on this drug, um, it required monitoring of the whole population to find, find the 3 or 4% of people with an adverse hepatic response. It's a very common problem in drug development. Uh, and so they came up with the daughter of Zilutin, which weren't, wasn't supposed to have this problem, and it was called ABT761. It acted at the same location, and that was the plan. So here was the clinical trial that we designed, actually helped design it. This was not a, a high-tech clinical trial. Uh, we enrolled patients on no treatment, and we assigned them to, these are asthma patients, to ABT761 or placebo. And since these were patients that we found on no treatment, continuing them on no treatment seemed like it was no problem. Now, this was seven or eight years ago. As the treatments progressed, it would be harder to do this trial now because uh, there are a lot of people who didn't get treatment who would. So uh, what happened was we genotyped everybody at the 5 lipoxygenase locus, and as we expected... No, I forgot to tell you one more thing, uh, which was that when the trial was uh, set up, Abbott, to save money, said, look, when a third of the patients complete... You don't enroll everybody on the first day. Usually it takes a couple of years to enroll. Um, but when a third of the patients complete their 12 weeks, we're going to compare the incidence of liver function tests in the placebo and ABT761 group. And if this drug isn't improving the rate of adverse effects, we're going to stop the trial because it's not worth another $40 million to find out something we don't want to know, which was that this drug wasn't in advance because they were hoping it would be in advance. And I thought that that was a very reasonable approach to life. So we genotyped everybody, and as you might expect, the wild type allele occurred most commonly, made up 81% uh, of the alleles. The deletion alleles, three and four, made up not 19%. The addition allele, six, was so rare, uh, there's one patient with it, that it really didn't add up to much. So when we stratified the results of FEV1 by uh, genotype, the patients that received active treatment 
and it had the wild type genotype, 5-5, improved their FEV1 about 17%. Patients on placebo with the 5-5 genotype improved their FEV1 5%. Now it turned out that there were uh, 14 patients that had active treatment that had no 5 allele. So they, we call them active XX, and they actually had their FEV1 get worse. And since we didn't stratify the enrollment by genotype, it turned out there was only one patient that had an XX genotype on placebo. And that person got better, but that's one patient. It's hard to make any sense out of that. So the likelihood, the p-value for this change in FEV1 was 10 to the minus fifth. This is unlikely to have happened by chance, but when we went into the trial, based on a preliminary uh, analysis of the data set that we never published, because we were concerned about uh, bias in ascertaining the patients. We had thought that heterozygosity at this locus would contribute to the phenotype. And it turned out that that's not the case. You had to be homozygous. So that the allele frequency here is 0.19 squared. So it's very small. It's about 3 or 4% of the population. So that from a pharmacogenetic perspective, it's interesting, but it's not economically interesting. On the other hand, if it had been 20% of the population, it would have been interesting. Because if you assume that you could do a genotype for 50 bucks, it's easier to treat the patient and see if they get better than genotype 100 people to find people, three people who aren't going to get better. Since there are also probably other reasons that you don't get better with this treatment other than this genotype. So it turned out to be pharmacoeconomically not very interesting. Now it turned out that uh, some work we did at the same time was that we got uh, eosinophils and we looked for the expression of mRNA by PCR of the ALOX5 gene. This is our control of cyclophilin A. And we had uh, four page, five patients here with a 5-5 genotype. And uh, most of them, but not all of them, have relatively high levels of the 5 ll picked up, ALOX5 that picked up by PCR. But none of the three patients that we did that had no 5 allele had this uh, Availability. And then we looked at the, the amount of LTC4, that is the leukotrienes produced by these eosinophils. Uh, the deletional variance, uh, there were four patients for that. Compared to five here, there was a significant difference in terms of lesser amounts of leukotrienes produced. So that suggested that uh, there was variation in this pathway. We've since looked at the cytosolic phospholipase A2, the LTC4 synthase, the epoxide hydrolase, all the other genes in this pathway, and we haven't found any other variant related to treatment response. There are variations, uh, but we did find, and this is actually interesting confirmatory data, and this is not our work, but the work of others, uh, what they reasoned was that if the enzyme, if the variants here that change the amount of leukotriene produced, that you should get the same pharmacogenetic effect if patients are treated with one of these drugs, which rather than inhibiting the enzyme, are receptor inhibitors. Uh, and in fact, I'll tell you that uh, in the trials done with the receptor inhibitors, I, uh, I'll get it back straight here. In the trials done with the receptor inhibitors uh, by others, that patients with the mutant form of the genotype don't respond uh, to the receptor inhibitors. So we're confirming our data. It's always heartwarming. So it suggests that variations in this pathway can contribute to a small fraction of the variance. So I think it's interesting pharmacogenetics, but it never made it pharmacoeconomically because it's a too small proportion of the population. You really have to, I think, affect 15% of the population, unless you're talking about, you know, a serious toxic event. Now, for example, with the gene thiopurine methyltransferase, which is a gene involved in the metabolism of uh, 6-mercaptopurine, which is a drug used to treat leukemia. Uh, among members of the population, especially people of Scandinavian heritage, uh, about 2 or 3 percent of those people harbor an allele where they don't metabolize 6-mercaptopurine uh, at the rate they should. And so if you give them the standard dose, they get toxic and you can actually kill them um, with the drug. So that when you're treating leukemia now, uh, it's standard with that drug, it's standard to genotype people to make sure they don't have one of these slow metabolizing alleles. And there now you're looking for a life-threatening toxicity 
which occurs at low frequency, but because the, uh, the consequences of missing it are so dramatic and so irreversible, it makes sense to screen a thousand people to find one. In fact, if you screen someone in Asia, you have to screen almost 5,000 people to find one. But yet, in treating leukemia in Asia, they're still doing it just because it's something that can be prevented if you're going to a higher class in a treatment center. Well, if you were screening at the Mayo Clinic, where there's a lot of Scandinavian blood, it really makes sense to do that. But for something like this, where the failure to respond to treatment is sort of a nuisance as opposed to a life-threatening event, didn't make pharmacoeconomic sense. And so my second example is about inhaled steroids. And inhaled steroids are different from antileukotrienes because we knew how antileukotrienes worked in asthma. I mean, they were developed based on understanding the biology of asthma. Uh, that was, but inhaled steroids we knew work based on observation, but steroids have thousands of potential mechanisms of action. And we had no idea which one was active. So some of this study is useful because if I can find a gene that controls steroid response, maybe that's telling me a gene that's important in the biology of asthma. And then I could develop a treatment that inhibited just that gene and wouldn't have a lot of the side effects of steroids because one of the big problems with steering, treating asthma with steroids is that if you're a kid, it makes you shorter. If you're an adult, it makes your bone, bones brittle. It causes acne to break down. It causes your skin to thin. It's got a lot of side effects that aren't terribly good. And to get rid of those side effects, uh, would be good and so you can sort of get at it. At the same time, with inhaled steroids, just like with antileukotrienes, you saw that there are about 40% of people who are paying for drugs who aren't getting any benefit. Now, the drug companies think that's perfectly fine. I don't, because they're getting the toxic effects, we know, but they're not getting the therapeutic benefit and it's costing them 50 bucks a month, sometimes more. The new inhaled steroids are actually 60 to 75 bucks a month. So it's an expensive habit. You know, it's about like your coffee habit. Um, if you buy a couple, cu couple of cups of coffee at the Starbucks, you, or even at the place down here, you're spending two, two and a half bucks a day on coffee. Or that 70 bucks a month. That's what an asthma attack uh, costs. So here we are showing two more populations. I showed you the green population with the, back, the excuse me, the purple population with the beclomethasone. There are two different inhaled steroids, uh, different from the ones I showed you, showing a variation in treatment response quite similar to the one that I showed you from that asthma trial. Now these two populations are ones that we studied. This was a, actually a drug company study done by Forest Labs uh, of one of their inhaled steroids. And this was one sponsored by the NIH called the Childhood Asthma Management Program, or CAMP. And even though they're once, once kids and once adults, a totally different study designs, you see this same variation in the asthma treatment response to inhaled steroids in three populations, allowing one to believe it's highly likely to be true. So what we did here is uh, we have a different candidate gene strategy. In the 5 lipoxygenase, we knew the genes in the pathway, and we could, we could identify them based on how the treatment worked. Here, we were guessing how the treatment worked. So, we got a bunch of people around in the room who thought knew about steroids and we compiled a list of possible genes in the pathway. We then looked for DNA sequence variants in that pathway. We then looked to see if there's a statistical relationship between clinical response and the presence of the sequence variant. And then we determined their functional relevance. And so, uh, I don't need to define SNPs, right? You all know about SNPs and haplotypes, right? Let's talk about that. Um, so here's our strategy. Uh, we had 32 control and 16 asthmatic cell lines, uh, which we had an infinite amount of DNA from. Uh, and we identified variants from sequencing and from the database. We then selected SNPs based on the allele frequency. We designed genotyping assays and did primary genotyping in the adult study. That was a drug company study of cases and controls. And what the cases and controls are people go back to many. 
what we're using is cases and controls was comparing people at this end of the graph to people at that end of the graph. So we'd call these controls in these cases, or vice versa. And then we would identify haplotype tag SNPs that had greater than 5% prevalence. And that gave us first pass statistical associations in the adult population. We then said, if this is true, we should be able to replicate it in the kids. And I said, if it's true still, we should be able to replicate it in a third population. And then uh, we sort of did some fancy statistics on it. So here are the three populations we studied. Um, this adult study is a drug company study, eight weeks in duration. People whose lung function as a percent of predicted is 70% to start. They're adults, they're age 40. Uh, and they're interesting, their steroid response is 7% on average. In the CAMP trial, which is our first replicate, they're kids, so their average age is nine. The trial duration was four years, not four weeks or four months. And their average improvement in FEV1 is 7%. And then in our second replication trial, it was a government sponsored six weeks. Again, average improvement is about 7%. So this is about what you get in these populations, is this kind of population. You get about 7% improvement in FEV1. This is the list of genes that we interrogated. Um, and there was, this was simply a list of genes made up by understanding the pathway, thinking how it could impinge on asthma. So it's entirely theoretical. And all right, so here are our primary outcomes using uh, the single SNP analysis of these are haplotype tag SNPs. So in the adult study, RS242941, so this is just the name of one of these haplotype tag SNPs, using the eight-week FEV1 percent change as a continuous variable, gave us a p-value of 0 0.025. Not uh, this is not a, this is adjusted for covariates, but not for the number of looks. We then did it in a camp population. Now many fewer looks. Uh, again, eight week percent change, continuous variable, p-value 0 0.006. So we were on a roll, and we looked at that same genotype in the ACRN population and didn't find a uh, didn't find a relationship. So that would have been hitting gold. And so we got silver or some other load. I'm not quite sure uh, what you want to call it. But we found was that there were, uh, these are three other haplotype tag SNPs, that this one, RS1876828, uh, which is in the same gene, CRHR1, the corticotropin releasing hormone receptor 1. Um, was positive in both populations. So we sort of got either second or third prize, depending on your perspective. The idea would have been had the same haplotype tag SNP positive in all three populations. What we found was different haplotype tag SNPs in the same gene, suggesting that it's the gene that's the problem, but not localizing the site. Not, you know, not actually getting to the what we think is the active problem. So kind of the, the half full way of looking at these data are that, gee, regardless, although I don't know the mechanism, if I genotype people at these low side, can I predict their response in lung function? So uh, this is the RSR. RS242941, that was the top one in the, in the kids, the camp, and the adults. And what we've now done is taken this haplotype tag SNP and looked at people that were heterozygous for it, excuse me, homozygous for it, heterozygous, and didn't have any copies of it. And you can see that if you own this genotype, that your improvement in FEV1 is almost twice as great as if you own this genotype, on average. When you uh, look at a uh, different haplotype. This is GAT haplotype pair. And this is now in the adult in the CAM study. Uh, you, even, it's a little more informative here. I have to show you the difference in the size of these bars. Here, this is about a 10 to 15 percent. Well, if you look here, this is now 15 to 20 percent. So this is a little bigger response. 
in people with this haplotype compared to people without it. So we think that it has some predictive value. Uh, it did not turn out to be statistically significant, as I, said, as I said again, in the ACRN population. Smaller number of people. It was in the right sign, but not statistically significant. Uh, this is a different genotype in that same gene, but a different SNP, the RS1876828, showing again that if you're homozygous versus AA versus GG, a big difference in response. But when we went back and did this population with that genotype, it didn't work out. The second thing we learned is that CRHR1 is probably involved in the biology of the asthma treatment response, suggesting that if you could target CRHR1 antagonist to the lung, here's CRHR1 receptor, it's a seven transmembrane spanning G protein coupled receptor. It's got a bunch of ligands in addition to corticotropin releasing hormone that uh, can activate it. And so some of the questions are, can you find it in the lung? So uh, this is one of these body blots that you buy from uh, one of those companies out west. Uh, you know, and you say all this RNA, and if you do, um, what we did here is uh, 12 cycles of PCR, and you pick it up in the positive control and in the brain. Remember, this is a hypothalamic hormone, so the fact that you find a hypothalamic hormone receptor in the brain is no surprise. If you do twice as much PCR, you not only pick it up in the brain, it shows up in the lung and the placenta, the thymus and lymph nodes, and shows up in epithelial cells and CD4 positive lymphocytes, all tissues that have been implicated in the biology of asthma. So at least it's where it needs to be. It doesn't quite meet Koch's postulates yet, but um, we're headed in the right direction. So the third example I think I'll talk about is a beta agonist receptor. So what I've done so far, I'm we'll talking about two association studies, clinical trials that were done. We then get the data and the DNA, and you do a bunch of genotyping and associations, but it's all post hoc. So now the story with beta agonists are slightly different. Uh, it's beta agonist inhalers are the most commonly used asthma treatment in the world. I don't know how many of you read the New England Journal of Medicine. Have you ever seen the New England Journal of Medicine? These nice graphics that you have that one five live pox nice picture I showed you. She's one of the artists that, that draws them. And uh, so that these inhalers are going off uh, worldwide at the rate of about a thousand times a second. So there's a lot of treat people using this kind of treatment. So in 1990, over almost 15 years ago, this file was started. Um, a long-acting beta agonist came out. Now, the problem with those little inhalers is they last three or four hours. So this drug company designed a drug that could last and agonize at the receptor for 12 hours. And the hypothesis was that if you took it on a regular basis, your asthma would improve because you'd be chronically bronchodilated. These drugs work by relaxing airway smooth muscle that's constricted in asthma. So uh, we had... Uh, in this trial designed by the sponsors, they were comparing this long-acting beta agonist with placebo, and it was a crossover design. So half the patients started on phenoterol, half started on placebo for 26 weeks of treatment. They got a month off, and then they were switched to the other treatment and followed for another 26 weeks. And in this trial, the primary outcome was an asthma exacerbation. Rather than measuring lung function, they said, I'm going to wait for your asthma to get bad enough for you to be upset by it. And I'm going to click off the asthma exacerbation box when that happens. And the hypothesis had been that during your phenoterol treatment, you'd have fewer asthma exacerbations than during your placebo treatment period. And because of the crossover design, everybody's in both arms. So when these data were published, um, the asthma world was surprised. Because uh, this is the number of subjects without exacerbation, it's time. If treatment was 100% effective, your line would go across here. Every time a patient has an asthma exacerbation, uh, the line ticks down and that patient's then censored from further analysis. And you could see that there, for about a, a week or so, they were the same. But then the patients that got the regular treatment, remember the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, this is supposed to make you better we're actually having more asthma exacerbations at any given point in time than the people who only use beta agonists when they needed it. And when these data came out, uh, 
there was concern uh, that actually this very commonly used asthma treatment was causing harm. And the fires were fueled by uh, this paper that was uh, published by my predecessors at the New England Journal. I had nothing to do with this. I'll let you know. Um, showing that the use of beta agonists was associated with the risk of death and near-death harassment. And what they did in this study is they went to this huge database, which is where every time you get a prescription in the province of Saskatchewan, somebody knows who you are and what prescription you got. And then they also match that with the asthma exacerbations, uh, asthma death file, and people who got really bad asthma because they have hospital records. And they discovered that the patients that used a lot of beta agonists either died from asthma or were admitted to the hospital with very severe asthma. And they concluded it was cause and effect. And they were totally wrong. This is a classic example of confounding by severity. Or more simply put, the sicker patients were using their beta inhalers a lot, and they're the ones that were more likely to die from asthma. So it was uh, bad epidemiology. But while we were working that out, um, this trial was uh, conceived of the people at the NIH became concerned that the common asthma medicine was making us sick. And so that we put together this trial called the beta agonist study. All clinical trials have to have a name. Otherwise, you have to say, remember that trial where they compared drug X to drug Y in a 24-week crossover design trial that was published in the Lancet? Uh, or can you say, remember the, the BAGS trial or something like that? So all good clinical trials have a name. This was the BAGS trial. And in this trial, we enrolled patients with really mild asthma for a six-week running period when they were on their standard treatment. And then they were randomized to receive either albuterol, which is a long, a short-acting beta inhaler. So you had to take it four times a day. This is the one that's uh, used so often around the world. And they were given a coated inhaler. It was white. It said, study drug, take two puffs four times a day. And I've already told you about four times a day medication. So this inhaler had it in a computer chip. And the patients knew this. Every time they pressed the inhaler, it recorded the time of day and the date. And we knew uh, that we had about 95% compliance, at least with pressing the inhaler. There wasn't a video camera in the computer chip. I don't know whether the patient actually inhaled when they pressed the inhaler. But we, we think that pressing the inhaler meant that they actually used it. Uh, and that was a coated inhaler. And they were also given an open-label albuterol and said, you know, if your asthma is still acting up, you can take this. And so that all the patients were given that. The placebo group was given an identical inhaler, identical instructions, identical computer chip, and open label albuterol. And the hypothesis was that if regular use of beta agonists was bad for you, that the blue group would do poorly compared to the green group. Now, rather than powering the study for asthma exacerbations, because for in these very mild asthma patients, it would have taken 1,000 patients studied for a year. We used a surrogate endpoint, which was lung function, strongly related to how patients do with asthma, uh, taken uh, over 20, over 16 weeks. And uh, here are the data, which we uh, published actually in the New England Journal of Medicine in 96, and showed that uh, the morning peak flow, which is our primary outcome, the uh, Two groups were not statistically distinguishable. Here it's a very expanded scale. And the difference between these two of 15 liters per minute is probably not significant. We had gone in saying that this difference, 25, was significant. And it got only halfway there. But interestingly, the blue group did a little poorer than the green group, even though the difference wasn't statistically significant. This was in the sign of these treatments being worse for you. But we concluded that they weren't worse for you. In fact, we looked at a bunch of outcomes. Now, while we were doing this trial, while the data accrual was going on, this is the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, a number of polymorphisms were identified in it. Now, these two, which are uh, right up here near the N-terminal part of the receptor, have very high allele frequencies. The minor allele frequencies are on the order of 0.4. So they're very common. And we knew from the work of others that these were functional. That is, that an ARG-16 receptor behaved differently than a GLY-16 receptor. 
We also knew that ARG16 was in very strong linkage disequilibrium with GLIN27. So that if you were ARG16, you were likely GLIN27. So what we did was we stratified the data from that clinical trial based on that on these genotypes. Again, a retrospective analysis. And here are the findings. If you had the gly, -gly genotype and used beta agonists on a regular basis, your morning peak flow after treatment oscillates around the zero line. If you had the ARGE ARGE genotype and only needed used beta agonists when you needed it, which work out to be about a puff every other day, nothing happened. But if you have the ARGE ARGE genotype and are using two puffs four times a day, there's a fall in peak flow during and after the active treatment period, suggesting that it's not that the drugs don't work anymore. In fact, when you take them, you get bronchodilation. But there's a side effect that when you're when the drug wears off, you're worse than you were before you started taking it. And that's what this is showing us, because this is the morning peak flow before treatment. So this says that using a drug on a regular basis makes you worse in the morning than you would be if you hadn't used the drug. But it's genotype related. So that led us to do a prospective trial. And so this is like the gold standard in this business. Rather than sifting through all data, we start off with new data and we design the BARGE trial, beta agonist receptor by genotype. And this was two identical trials in which uh, patients were enrolled with the ARGE ARGE genotype. A matching GLI GLI genotype patient was found, at least with respect to sex and lung function. And then both groups of patients were put in this design. And the idea was that in the ARGE ARGE patients, we expected that placebo would be superior to albuterol because we think that these are the patients where albuterol, given regularly, has a detrimental effect. While in the gly, -gly patients, this difference would not exist. And then if we then did a genotype by treatment interaction, we would say that if you look at gly, -gly on active treatment versus ARGE, -ARGE on active treatment, that these patients would be better, these patients would be worse, and there'd be a big difference between the two groups. And that's how we designed it. Our primary outcome variable, again, was a um, measurement of lung function, morning peak flow, with these secondary outcomes. So we enrolled 332 patients that got genotyped. 78 um, met the criteria. So this is an interesting trial, because as far as I know, it's the first trial where uh, people were enrolled by genotype in a non-malignant condition. They came in and they met clinical and physiological criteria They say, you're a patient for our trial. Now let's genotype you. Because we knew that one out of six people was an ARGE ARGE. If you were then met the criteria and were an ARGE ARGE, you were enrolled in the trial. We then went to the people who we determined to be gly gly and looked for a match, sex, lung function and center where they were studied. So uh, we ended up with, uh, with these people. Uh, these were the baseline characteristics of the two group. We matched on sex and we came as close as you could um, in terms of the proportions that were uh, Caucasian. They worked out to be about the same. Uh, their ages worked out to be the same. Their lung functions worked out to be the same. So we had two reasonably matched groups of people that differed with respect to their genotype at the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. So this was um, unexpected. What happened in this trial was different from our other trials, was that we had the patients off of or on beta agonists on a regularly scheduled basis, but they had a beta agonist inhaler they were using if their asthma acted up. So when we did this trial, we switched their rescue inhaler from a beta agonist inhaler to another type of rescue inhaler called atrovantin, ipropion bromide, which doesn't work at this receptor. And we allowed six weeks for patients to get used to using that treatment. 
Well, they hadn't expected this to happen, but what happened was in the gly gly patients, their peak flow stayed fixed. Well, in the arch arch patients who were using this treat, the, their albuterol four or five times a day, just kind of as regular use, when we switched them to propion bromide over six weeks, improved their lung function 30 liters a minute, actually 28 liters a minute. Now that's as good as you get out of most treatments you pay money for. And all we did was switch them from albuterol to petropium bromide. But in our trial design, we said the zero point is going to be six weeks. So all our comparisons are made from here, but we had this big effect during the run-in, which we hadn't counted on. Then during the trial, so the arge arge is yellow, the gly gly is blue. They start off with peak flows of around 470. The arge arges get worse on active treatment while the gly glys get better. While on placebo, the arge arges get better and the gly glys get worse. This is the primary outcome peak flow. When we express it this way, this is now morning peak flow. And so each of these bars represents a difference between active and placebo. So if active is worse than placebo, you go down. And if active is better than placebo, you go up. R is red, gly is green. And you see that the difference between the two, highly statistically significant uh, with a, a value that's on the order of 23 liters per minute. We said 25 is statistically, it would have been clinically significant. It came close, but didn't hit that bar. Um, and then in evening peak flow, the difference is also in the same sign, but interestingly, there had been some recovery of lung function uh, during the day. Our other outcomes, FEV1, and difference again in the same sign. Our charges get worse, glyglys get better. The difference is about 150 liters per minute. Everybody agrees this is statistically significant. When we look at symptoms, and here a bigger number is more symptoms. There are more symptoms when the patients are using the drug on a regular basis than there are when they're using placebo. Again, in the sign of glycolize doing better on active and our drug is doing worse on active treatment. So highly, highly likely not to have occurred by chance. Now, my final outcome here is how often the patients had to use a rescue inhaler. The ipratropium bromide was the non beta agonist rescue inhaler. Albuterol is a beta agonist rescue inhaler. And we found the same thing. Remember, during this period, the patients are using their, they're getting albuterol eight puffs a day already, and they're taking more of it. And it's not enough. While when the, when the glycolides are using it eight puffs a day, they cut back on their daily use. So the difference between these groups, three puffs a day, is highly significant. Um, and in the sign that we're making these patients, the arch arch patients, worse with uh, active treatment. So, so the conclusion out of this one is that about one sixth out of patients with asthma in the U.S. are probably being made worse by their uh, albuterol treatment, which is actually very commonly used asthma therapy. Now, this study was not powered for asthma exacerbations. Uh, to do that, we would have had to study as I said, about a thousand people for a year. As it, and to, to study a thousand people, we've had to screen three thousand, or maybe more like four thousand, because we're, it's going to be genotype stratified. But these two things track, and those kinds of trials are under consideration, but are not completed yet. So I'm giving you three examples: anti-leukotrienes, where we show an, an effect based on what we know about the biology of the pathway, but one of little pharmacoeconomic consequence. Inhaled steroids, where we weren't quite able to replicate um, the finding of three genes, but we have a gene, but probably not a SNP. Um, related to steroid response, be also useful to try to do a, a controlled prospective trial that way. And then with, with the beta agonist, where we've done the controlled prospective trial, showing the genotype makes a difference in treatment response. So that it's more than just a, an idea. It's something that can actually uh, reduce the practice. And so these are three examples in asthma treatment, which has the advantage of being a recurrent disease requiring chronic therapy. 
you know, if I were doing a trial where I had a, you know, um, where I wasn't allowed to take patients off treatment, right? Uh, you know, where the outcomes are going to be strokes or heart attacks, or terrible events, then you'd be you don't have this kind of freedom. Even when you're using blood pressure as an outcome, you don't like to let someone's blood pressure go uncontrolled. But here, you can really show a genotype by treatment interaction, different kinds of ways. And you can sort of expand this to other kinds of diseases, doing the right kinds of treatment trials, where you begin to enroll people by genotype and informative genotypes, which you find out from the evaluation of old data to decide whether you know, this makes sense to move forward. So this is where I see, the, to me, one of the major advantages of uh, genetics in actual medicine is. I mean, I can find the genes that cause things, but all I can do is give you bad or good news. You, know? you don't have the gene for Huntington's disease. You don't have the gene for Parkinson's disease, or you do. And now you're going to worry about it, but you can't do anything about it. Right? I might be able to tell you of the gene for uh, a form of emphysema and you shouldn't smoke because that's, but still, there's very little that, the information that I can do with the information about a gene that I harbor or don't harbor other than making decisions about my kids and whether I want to have kids or who I want to marry. And it's interesting, in um, some regions of uh, New York City where they have these arranged Ashkenazi Jewish marriages, and where they have a number of genetic diseases, you know, they're actually genotyping the couples, the people in the in, in the arranged marriages, so that they don't end up with Tay-Sachs disease and other, you know, commonly inherited. And, but they're arranged marriages. A lot of marriages these days aren't arranged. But uh, so it's not terribly useful information. If, on the other hand, you have a disease, and I can look at your genotype and modify my treatment. So that in one case you're likely to get better, in another case I know that a drug isn't going to work for you. That's a much more medically useful thing to know. I'm sorry that you inherited these genes that are going to cause you to have this bad disease, but at least I know from your genetic profile what treatment you're more likely to respond to. And so that's why I think that it, what is going to make a difference in genetics and medicine, this is going to make a difference. And we're seeing it now. Um, with leukemias. They're going through and doing these studies looking at patients that have a certain kind of leukemia who are likely to have a good treatment response and who aren't likely to have a good treatment response. Now there what that means is that if you're in the good treatment response group, I can treat your leukemia and maybe not come so close to killing you. Well, if you're in a bad treatment response group, I'm going to get out everything I possibly can from day zero and I'm going to try to wipe out every cell. So that I think this is much more medically useful than finding causative genes is to find genes that help us modify and understand our treatment response. So that's my story.